Jesus. Can we do that? There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. Sometimes we and the words don't get along up there, but we know what's right. We got it right. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ladies, going to come sing. Let's pray. Thank the Lord for the good morning and appreciate the good preaching. Amen. The Word of God will help you and had good fellowship today, so we thank the Lord for that. And appreciate the guys working in the back trying to keep things working right. Brother James had a cord that was bad and had nothing to do with him or us or them. It's just sometimes equipment breaks, and you know the devil's going to do that at the, at the worst moment he can. So uh, thank the Lord. We've got a fix on that. Brother Chris was able to get in here this afternoon and get that figured out, get it fixed. We're in good shape, so we praise the Lord for that. Remember, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. So bring your friends and family. we got some other churches that's supposed to come be with us. Uh, so pray that... Uh, Folks who get in here and hear the truth of God's Word. Amen. That's what this is all about is to get the truth of God's Word out and help and encourage folks in that. So you help us pray about that. Pray about what the Lord have you to give in the meeting and uh, help us take good care of God's man. It always helps you and blesses the church uh, when you help take good care of God's man. Amen. We had family fed him today and we're thankful for that. We had a good, good food. Amen. And uh, got my fish killed. He's laid down and done great. I've done all right this afternoon. So we thank the Lord for that. And a good fellowship this morning. Uh, uplifted hands for requests tonight. Anyone got something on your heart all over the building? Oh, I have another. Yeah, I have one. Yeah, I remember, remember Noah. Noah's five. And he had a super terrible bad episode this week. Had to go to the ER. He wasn't breathing. She done a post on Facebook. Some of you do that. Some of you don't. But uh, he lost. He wasn't breathing. wasn't responding. A whole, whole terrible scary time. Uh, they took him to the hospital. They're not sure. They're thinking either uh, the croup or some other kind of something that's going on. And that's what they called it. Uh, could be an asthmatic work starting. They're not sure. So... Pray, but remember Miss Kelly just had her procedure and she really needs rest. Uh, and this has really labored her a lot. So pray for them. They really need they really need a good touch from Jesus in this time uh, to give some healing and some help and some rest. So remember the Beatty family. As you pray throughout the night, throughout the day, please lift them up in every prayer that you can because they sure do need it all. Okay? 
Father, we come to you tonight. We are grateful for the privilege and the opportunity to be here. We thank you that we can come to you in the name of Jesus, your precious and powerful son. We pray that, Lord, you'll take and work tonight. Help the ladies as they sing. Help the preacher as he preaches. And we do pray that, God, your will would be done in every man's heart, every woman's heart, every young person's heart. Encourage us all to do the work of the Lord. We know that the days are coming when the work will cease. And we'll be with you. But I pray you'll help us in these days to do all that we can as long as we can. God, please be with the Beatty family. Please touch them. Please give them some relief. They've got so many different things that's going on in their lives. And uh, I know Miss Kelly needs rest. She needs help. She needs healing. I know that David needs some help. It's terrible for a dad to be gone and that to happen and him try to get to him. Uh, the heart-wrenching effect that that has. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with them and bless them in a special way. And then for the other children as well. God be with them. You've seen the uplifted hands tonight. Father, I pray that you'd attend to each one of those requests according to your perfect will. And again, have your will in your way. Thank you that we're able to be here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm grateful that it does matter to him no matter what we go through, what we face. The devil always says... You're not going to make it. And I wasn't just with me. But I'm grateful with him. Amen. I am going to make it. Amen. When life gets you down And you feel more broken than whole When the wounds go deeper than words And you can't tell a soul I may not know what you're going through May not can make that high mountain move But one thing i found That I really want you to know He wants to share the burdens you bear Whisper peace when your world gets shattered If it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain Or you're really needing an answer If it matters to you it matters to the master. Friend, do you think the maker and giver of life is far too busy to care about your trouble and strife? He sees the sparrow that falls to the ground And he hears the tears that don't make a sound If you only knew how precious you are in his sight If it matters to you It matters to the master wants to share the burdens you bear whisper peace when your world gets shattered if it's your greatest joy or your deepest pain or you're really needing an answer if it matters to you it matters to the master your greatest joy or your deepest pain or you're really needing an answer if it matters to you it doesn't only matter to you if it matters to you it matters to the 
the master. Savior there as he talked to his father in earnest prayer. He said, if it be thy will, Lord, let this cup pass from me. But if not, Lord, it satisfies me. If it satisfies you, Lord, then it satisfies me. These few words may my prayer ever be. If you have me on a mountain or in a valley on my knees, either way, Lord, it satisfies. Trust 
seen the blood. Jesus won a great victory that day on the tree. And he said in his name, I could claim it for me. For all of my needs, he is more than enough. So I'm looking to Calvary and trusting the blood. I'm trusting the blood. Too dark, 
God cannot come in. There is no sorrow too deep. He cannot soothe it. And if he carried the weight of the world upon his shoulders, I know my brother that he will carry Thank you, ladies. That's good. Appreciate the good music tonight. Appreciate Brother Jones and Miss Sandra being with us. Brother Jones is going to come preach to us a little while. And uh, whatever the Lord's laid on his heart for this evening. And uh, you give your heart and attention to it, and God will give you something. Amen. Amen. Thank you, preacher and Miss Sandra, for coming. Giving your time to us. God bless you, brother. God bless you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much again for the invitation to be here. And we certainly do appreciate everyone who is present this evening, trusting the good Lord has given you a great afternoon and will give you a great night and tune our hearts toward what he's going to do for us in this service and also in the remaining services of this meeting. I couldn't help but think about... Um, one of the in one of the songs the ladies were singing about what Peter had to say in First Peter chapter five and verse seven, where he said, "Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you." Amen. There's a lot of things that I go through or you go through that doesn't mean anything to anybody else. A lot of cares. We carry, but someone else may snigger at it. But then again, we may snigger at some of the cares they have. But that's not the way it is with the Lord. Amen. If anything is a care to us, it is a care to him. Yes, and how thankful we are that we are privileged to cast them upon him. I want to ask you this evening to mark 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll be going there in just a few minutes. We're returning back for our text in Hebrews chapter 4. There's a whole lot more here than I can preach in uh, two nights or two times especially. And uh, probably a whole lot more if I knew what I should know. It would probably be a lot longer than that to get it done. But I'm so thankful that we have the privilege to open his scriptures and read out of them. And uh, so if that place marked, I want to just say a word or two where we were this morning and then relate it to what I find in First Peter or Second Peter chapter one, and hopefully bring them together and revolve the comments we want to make this evening around the theme that is taught in both places. Now, when we finished this morning, we were, uh, as I told a church not long ago, I never get done. I just have to quit along the way. 
and I know the pastor understands what that's all about. But we were talking this morning about this matter of rest, and we learned that it's not a rest of salvation, for redemption has already been wrought and is working in their hearts and lives. But the rest is that rest of consecration. When we get to the place that we give our hearts and lives wholly and fully as we possibly can unto the Lord and his cause upon the earth, that we ourselves bow out of the picture and give him full control in our life. And we were talking about resting in the Redeemer's work and all that Christ wrought on the cross in my and your behalf is not completely fulfilled in the matter of our being saved. But what he did in his work on the cross also wrought for us, especially the promise of the Holy Spirit coming to furnish us everything we're going to need in our life of service for him. And so you see, being saved ought to mean more to us than just going to heaven. And some people think that is it. Well, I've been saved. I'm going to give my, I've given my heart to Christ, and I believed in him, and I know I'm going to heaven when I die, so that's all that matters. I would check up on an attitude like that, number one, if something really had transpired in my life, if I truly had been saved by the grace of God. For being saved means that we are a child of God. That means he's our father. And so that we are to bow to him and respect him as we did our earthly father. And so with those things in mind, there are two ways that we can enter into heaven. Now, I don't mean two ways to be saved. Now, listen carefully. I am an independent Baptist, so that means I have to qualify about everything I say. Isn't that terrible? Yeah. Uh, but we can go to heaven abundantly, right. or we can go just by fire. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, so they're saved so as by fire when our works are burned up. I don't want my works, all of them, to burn up. I'm sure some of them will, but I don't want my, all of my works to burn up and me standing there with nothing. There was a song that was popular back several years ago, Must I Go In Empty-Handed. You remember that song? Uh, we all should desire to take someone with us as we go. We don't always have the opportunity to stand and witness to somebody, but there are gospel tracts that we can give. And I like what Sammy Allen said about a gospel tract. He said, there's one thing about them, they will track you. And so there's a message in them. And so that message is given us out of the scripture and it is the truth of the word of God. So with that said, and if you remember in Revelation chapter four, we find the Lord Jesus seated upon the throne and we find the 20 and four elders round about the throne. And the Bible said that they fall before him that is on the throne and they cast their crowns before that throne and they say, for thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 11. I think it would be sad to have been saved any length of time without any crowns to cast at his feet. Not because we've earned them. We heard some things about that this morning. Boasting in what we are and what we have accomplished. To be perfectly honest with you, we are nothing. Christ is everything. 
nor have we accomplished anything ourselves. It has been him who has given us the strength and the wisdom and that which is essential for us accomplishing things for his glory and for his honor. And I think keeping that in mind will go, goes a long way with the Lord. Let me uh, illustrate it uh, like this. Uh, Ahab was a wicked king, if you remember. In fact, the Bible said that all the kings before him did not provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger as much as he did. Now, remember the first king of Israel was Jeroboam when the kingdom had divided Rehoboam over the southern kingdom and Jeroboam over the northern kingdom. And Jeroboam got to thinking, well, if I don't do something to keep my people up here, then they'll go back to Jerusalem for to worship God there in the, in the temple. And so therefore, I will lose my domain. So he made golden calves, if you remember, and said, these be the gods that brought thee out of Egypt. And so they were to worship them. It's either 16 or 19. I, I get it mixed up because the northern kingdom had a total of 19 kings, and every one of them were evil. Perhaps it is 16 times. It is recorded of the sin that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, caused Israel to do. If you remember all of that, but yet God said about Ahab, he did more to stir up the anger of the Lord than all the kings that were before him. Now, I said all of that to say this, because when Elijah told him, met him, and said that the dogs were going to lick up his blood in the place that they had licked up Naboth's blood, whom Jezebel had sent false witnesses, the witness against Naboth, and had him stoned to death, and the Bible said the dogs licked up his blood. Well, then Ahab was slain in battle. They came back and washed the chariot out, and the dogs were there and licked up the uh, blood of Ahab as it had mixed in with the water and ran out of the chariot. But he said something else. He said that the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. Now that's the same God that these ladies were singing about that loves us and this group sang about this morning and keeps us and furnishes us all that he does, all his goodness unto us, it cannot by any means ever be told. We can't even understand it, let alone can we get all out that his love means unto us. But the Bible said when, when Ahab heard the message of Elijah that he humbled himself and God looked upon that humility of this wicked king and said, I'll not bring it to pass in his days. You remember that? We could go on and on. So there's something about this matter of being humble before the Lord God Almighty. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. And also, another thing that comes in, into play here is a matter of our reigning with Christ when he comes back to establish his kingdom upon the earth and reigns for a thousand glorious years. I'm confident that what we do in our life of service for him here will have something to do with what our reign with him means and is going to mean to us in that day. So it behooves you and I to live for Christ and do everything we possibly can to please him in this life. I want us now with a second or Peter chapter 1 marked. I want to read this. I want to relate it to what our text is about the rest of consecration. And hopefully we can revolve our comments uh, in our remaining time before you around this great truth. If you look in verse 10, we can read on. Here's this word we talked about this morning. Wherefore, the rather brethren... 
Give diligence. You remember I said let us labor is translated by one word in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Well, here it is. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. The reason a lot of people have problems with assurance of their salvation is because the way they live their lives upon earth. Amen. We can expect to live for ourselves and have the peace of God rule in our heart and in our life. So it's essential to do that. It benefits you and I in so many ways in our life. Now look at verse 11. This is what I was talking about earlier. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what Peter is saying simply is this, and what Paul was saying, and what this book of Hebrews is saying, is we can go into heaven just by fire, just getting into heaven, only because we're saved by the mercy and grace of God, <clears throat> or we can go in in an abundant entrance being ministered unto us. And again, someone says, well, all that matters to me is if I go to heaven. You better check that out. We ought to want to please him who loved us and gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. This is in Titus the chapter 2 and verse 14, zealous of good works. And so that's the kind of people he has redeemed. So now let's look back to Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to read our text again that we did on this morning. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow is a discerner and, and uh, thoughts of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. This word manifest means clearly visible. It means openly declared. So what I'm saying to you is God knows everything there is to know about every one of us. You know, it's easy sometimes for a child to put on a front to the parent. It's easy sometimes maybe for a church member to put on a front to a pastor. But none of us can put on a front to God because he knows, and I, I may cover this later and I may not even get to it, but he knows what's behind the mask of, uh, of any uh, pretender. And he also knows what's behind the motive, why we do what we do. God knows all about that and how important it is in my and your living for him. Now, I want you to pray with me and I want you to pray for me. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to be before these people. I thank you, Lord, for the warm spirit that we have received in our souls and thank you for the friendly welcome that we have received by the members of this church. I pray for your blessings to rest upon everyone. I do not know the condition of any heart that's here. I only know what you put upon my heart and you would have me to preach. So Lord, in my own heart, oh, as the great hymn writer wrote, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Lord, let me not just preach for those who are present here, but help me to preach for myself, to learn what you would have me to learn out of your wonderful word. I ask my prayer and offer my thanksgiving in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
amen and amen. I want to begin by saying that God's relationship to his people is stated in this word of God. It is shown to us as the word of God is unveiled before our eyes and revealed unto us by the Holy Spirit. And let me assure you, if you are saved by the grace of God, the Holy Ghost indwells you. And it's not the preacher who causes you to see. All the preacher can do is give out the word. But it's the Holy Spirit who illumines that word to our heart, the eyes of our heart, and we're able to see and we're able to understand. So not only is his relationship stated in this word of God, it also is shown in this word of God And then finally, and I love this part, it is secured by the word of God. God cannot lie in hope of eternal life, which God uh, that cannot lie promised before the beginning of this world. I think I missed that verse up, messed that verse up a little bit, but began before uh, that he promised before the world began. And that's exactly it. And so God cannot lie. Whatever he stated in this Bible and the songs that have been sung here today, this morning and tonight, that talks about God being what he is according to what the scriptures teach us makes you and I know that we can be assured of God's word unto us. He cannot lie. What he has promised, he is going to fulfill. Now, just how many features there are to this word of God? Look with me, please, in verse 12. I do not know, but I do know this about it. Amen. I do know this. I know, number one, it is alive. And if you will notice here, and it is active. For he says, for the word of God is quick. The word of God is ever living and the word of God is ever lasting. So it is alive. It's working in our hearts, in our lives. What makes the songs that uh, are sang by the congregation, by the special groups, what makes those songs, those words bring hope and cheer to the heart of those who hear them and those who sing them? What is it that does that? It's the assurance that we know God has said these things and he's not going to lie uh, to you and I. So the word of God is quick and powerful. And then it also, he says, is sharp here. And it's not only sharp, but it severs. This Bible will cut things out of our life that we do not need in our life as a child of God. And it will cut us a separate from so many things in the world that are wrong and that Christians ought not to be involved in. It penetrates in our life. You see all of this here in verse number 12. It penetrates and it probes around. I'm thinking about sometimes when the preacher preaches and I've heard, I don't know how many people I've heard give this testimony. I went to church and I thought somebody had told that preacher everything about me. Well, he didn't know anything about that person. He was just preaching what God gave him. And you see, the word of God reveals to us what God sees in us and what we all do. I have several people I try to pray for every day of my life and ask God to move and work in their life and open their eyes. Let them see where they are, what's going on. Let them see the sin as he sees sin. You know, we, we live in a, in a day when almost anything we can excuse one way or another, but that's not what we need to see. We do not need the approval of the brethren on our life We need the approval of God upon our life because when we go before the, uh, to give an account of our life, uh, you, you sweet people and your kind words unto me already. uh, And some of you, I remember from when I was here before 
And so I want to say that that doesn't, that does not settle the matter because it's not what you think but it's what he knows about you and I that is so important in our life. I want to give you an illustration here. This is a true event. And by the way, my books are filled with stories, some of them. I mean, just one, not one story after another, but it's full of stories. And there's not one story in any of my books that's exaggerated or made up. And if I said it happened to me, it did if I said it happened to somebody else, it happened to somebody else. I, I, I want to be honest. But anyway, I was preaching on a Sunday night. And for some reason, and I can't remember, oh, I know what I was doing. I was talking about my relationship with God and wanting to venture out and do everything that God had for my life. And so I had a habit I don't think is good for Christians. I don't think it will help a Christian to have this to have this habit at all. And this habit was, see, I smoked. And when I was a boy growing up, and young man, don't, uh, young man, hey, hey, young man, don't ever put a cigarette in your mouth, okay? Don't you ever do that, all right? And I, when I was about your age, I started. That's truth because everybody, my dad smoked, all my uncles smoked except one. And uh, so about everybody in the community either smoked or chewed tobacco that I grew up in. I'm, I grew up in a different world than young people are growing up in today. I promise you all the way around is a different world. But, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, everybody else do it, so why don't you do it? So I started it just when I was a young boy about his age. And so anyway... I got up, and so after I'd given my heart to Christ and I was going to serve him, I thought, well, I'm going to. And when I grew up, uh, they had a break between, like you did this morning, Sunday school and church. You had a little break. Well, the men would gather together out uh, by the church house and have a, what I called a smoke break. Now, one of our pastors, he did not smoke, but he chewed tobacco. So he would go out and take him a couple of uh, swallows around, you know, and roll around his mouth and spit out. And then we'd come in and have a church. And I thought God was in the place. And honestly, I really believe he was. We just didn't know any better. But now we do know a whole lot better. So I thought, I can't do that. And so, boy, you, you see this? They call that male pattern baldness. That's not it at all. That's where I pull my hair out trying trying to quit that awful habit of smoking. It's a, it's a horrible, horrible habit to try to quit. And so I, I finally got the, and I, I thought, now I've got to have some help on this. And so uh, what I thought, I'll just chew tobacco for a while. And so that will help me. And, and so my wife wouldn't let me use a spit can in the house. Thank you, honey. And so what, what I would do, I would, uh, I, I had a, I, I chewed a red man. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever seen a red man chewing tobacco? And so what I would do, this is true. This is true. I would take a half a pack and stick it in my jaw when I got to work about eight o'clock. I mean, I looked like I had an apple in, in, in the side of my head. And so I, I would chew that and water around, and it would last for two, two and a half hours. It just depended on uh, how bad I, I wanted to chew it. And so anyway, then, you know, it's just an hour and a half to dinner. And so after dinner, I would put the other half. I'm talking about a whole pack. Put the other half of that pack in my jaw, and I chewed it and, until maybe 3 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. And so I went home at 5, and so I... And that went on for days and days. And so I got to thinking about this matter. I was leading the singing at our church. I was a church clerk. I taught the young adult Bible class. And I thought, now, Lord, I want, I want to be a better Christian than I am. And so I would go up to the church and I would pray. Lord, I want you to help me. If there's anything in my life, Lord, that you don't want in my life, uh, reveal it to me. You know how we are. 
we, we tell the Lord that, but uh, and, and if He shows us something that we want and that He don't want, to why well, we we won't argue about it. I mean, let, there's nobody here but us chickens, so let's just be honor, honest with one another. And so I was praying, and so I said, Now, Lord, if there's anything in my life, I want to do more for you. I want to be true to you. If there's anything else, I- anything in my life that I have not given up already, I want you to show me what it is. And that chief came floating by. I could just see him, you know, with that red bonnet on. I, I could just see him coming by. And so I would pray and I'd say, now, Lord, uh, anybody else like me? Amen. Now, Lord, if that is, now, Lord, if that is really wrong, Amen. You you just let me know, and and Lord, I'll quit it. Lord, I will if if I know for sure. And so it would go away. And I would pray. I'd just keep praying. Here he'd come again. And so I mean that went on for days, ladies and gentlemen. And so finally, finally, I said, Lord, you must not want it. So I'm going to quit it. But you're going to have to help me now, Lord. You're going to have to help me. And the Lord did, and the Lord did help me. He really did. And so I was just telling that story in my sermon to our church on a Sunday night. And so there was a fellow went out the door named Brother Hubert Phillips. He was a, he was just a jewel. Sam and I was talking about him. I think on the way over here, loved the Lord and and just wanted things right. And I promise you one thing: you couldn't preach too tough for him. I mean, I don't care what you preached on; he was with you. And uh, so if everybody else was kind of, you know. Uh, Doing, doing whatever I, you could look at old Hubert here right there, you know he he and I'd look to him getting encouraged and I'd go on and so I told that story and that's an actual story that happened and so he went out he was going out the door and said brother Hubert how you doing he just shook my hand and just went to dying laughing I said well I said uh, what's so funny brother Hubert he said I knew they would tell on me I said what are you talking about. He said, last Friday night we were coon hunting and I took a chew of tobacco and I knew that they would tell on me. Well, nobody told me anything. And I, that's amazing, you know, how, how the word of God works. And sometimes we think maybe the preacher's being mean to us and somebody's told him something about us. And well, he doesn't know anything. He's just preaching the Bible the way that it is. And so it is God who knows, who tells the preacher. Now, I wouldn't even, I would not even have thought about that story except it came to mind. So I thought I would tell it. And, and I thought I was doing good, but, but Brother Hubert, it, it really got him. And isn't that amazing? And you know, we, we've heard, I don't know how many people that I've heard talk like that. They said they finally got me to go to church and I knew why they wanted me to go because they had told the preacher everything bad about me and so he got up and produced his whole sermon. I mean, I've heard that. Used his whole sermon on me. I was the only person in the church. He just kept looking at me and kept, I mean, that, that's just it, but it's not. It, it's that the Lord, the Lord loves us and the Lord wants us to honor him and love him in, in, and be faithful to him. Why? Because of this abundant entrance. That's going to mean something. Now, the person has that ideal just as long as I get in heaven. That's all that matters to me. I'll tell you, when we get there before him and we look into that eyes as a flame of fire, and he can see all the way through us and everything about us. It's going to really mean something then that we did our best to try to please him while we live in this life. And that's why the, what your pastor won't tell to you. I mean, do if, if, you remember Job? And, and when one of the counselors had come, they, in so many words, he said this to Job. you doing righteous. Is that going to help God out? Amen. you you doing mean. Is that going to damage God? No, and it's the same way the preacher. Preacher doesn't get another feather in his hat if you consecrate your life to Christ. 
He, he just loves you and wants you to do that because in the end, you remember what Paul said? He said, I desire fruit. Why? That it may abound to your account. And so that any preacher whose heart is in his people, that's the way he feels about the matter. He wants fruit. He wants you fruitful. Why? Because we're going to stand before the Lord. We're going to give an account of our life and how important it's going to be then when we stand before him. Now, quickly, notice seven things the word of God does. And so I've, I've given you some already. Well, let me say that it divides and it discerns. It, it will cut you away from some things and let you know why those things are displeasing. All right, it examines and it exposes. All these things happen through the word of God we read about here in verse 12. But notice seven, I think it's eight. But notice the things here that we know for sure that the word of God does. Number one, it convicts of sin. And that's why we're to preach the word of God. Because if we love people, we don't want them to live with sin in their life. Because that's going to be costly unto them. Not only when we stand before the Lord, but in this life too. Sin has a way to slay. It kills. Amen. The reason I'm going to die and the reason you're going to die. And the pastor was talking about some people who had died and went on to glory. Well, you know what killed them? Sin. And it, it's terrible when we, uh, when people have the concept that because of of the uh, tornadoes that come, and because of the storms that build up at sea, and the earthquakes transpire, and the volcanoes erupt, that God is a mean God because of all the consequences of those uh, things that of those let's call them calamities. Okay and tsunamis and all of these things that happened. You know what caused all that? This earth was perfect until sin entered it. And then ever since sin, you know there were not even any pests. Any, you could have planted your garden, sir. I, I don't know if you make a garden or not. You probably make her. I have to listen to you today. You probably make, make her make the garden. I don't know, but... But, but anyhow, but you, could, you could make a garden. You didn't have to worry about a bug. Amen. You didn't have to worry about weeds. Right. But sin brought all of those thorns and thistles and devouring insects and all these things. So what, what I, I am saying is sin is responsible for all of it. There's a lot of sicknesses. that come. Do you know Adam would have never gotten sick had he not sinned? Every bit of that stems from sin. So you see why God wants us as much as we possibly can because we're not going to live perfect. We're going we're to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We may even get involved in sin from time to time. Not because we want to, because of what the weakness of the flesh. Remember, we, t we read about that in the scriptures, the weakness of of, of the flesh. And so anyway, it, it, it causes things. And so God doesn't want it in our life. But number one, he convicts of sin. But it's not only at conversion, but it's throughout our Christian life. If we get too close to people that we shouldn't be involved around and with, I mean, the, the word of God will show us the Holy Spirit will lead us and direct us away from them so it convicts of sin. And then number two, it converts the soul. We know that. And that's, that's why the preacher preaches and, and he gives the word of God. Why? Because it will convict us of our sin. If we're never convicted of our sin, we see no need to be saved. I went to church all my life. I had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ thousands of times. The school that I grew up in was a three-room schoolhouse. It was called Sulphur Springs School. Um, we called it, uh, uh, they got another name for it now, I think. Uh, but it wasn't called an elementary school. That's what it was. But it was just a little school. And it went all the way to the eighth grade. And so it had three rooms, and I had three teachers. I had... Um, Gertrude Johnson, boy, whew, she was something else. And um, then, then we, she was, 
we were something else. She was good. <laughs> Let me turn that around, okay? And then we had Maxie Shinliver, and then we had Fletcher Dale. He was the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teacher and also the principal of the school. That's the school I grew up in. And every one of my teachers were Christians, not just in name. They attended a church in our valley faithfully. Every one of our teachers prayed for us every morning and read the Bible to us, and we said the pledge of allegiance to the flag of our blessed nation. Every day, we did it every school day. And so what I'm saying is I'd heard the gospel so many times. And in fact, I heard the gospel uh, whenever I got old enough inside my mother to hear. I don't know how old you have to be to do that. I know one thing, my wife and I, and uh, well, that was before any of our children were born, and we were singing one night, kind of a little uh, fast song. And Stephen uh, was, uh, Sandra was expecting Stephen, and he got to dancing or something. I don't know what, what went on. <laughs> yeah, you probably, because you know him. And, and so anyhow, he got, he got to kicking and jumping or whatever was going on so hard, Sandra had to sit down. So what I'm saying, the baby can hear. A, ba a baby inside the mother can hear. So I don't know how many times I heard the gospel. I went to church every time the doors opened. My dad saw that we were there. And I had a Christian grandparents. All four of my grandparents were Christians. They gave me the gospel. I had aunts that were Christian that gave me the gospel. My school teachers gave me the gospel. People talked of the gospel in the, in the valley that I was reared in. And so I went to church. I don't know how many times I'd heard the gospel. I'd heard it. But for some reason, I had never seen myself a lost sinner. But one morning, I was sitting at the Pleasant View Baptist Church for the first time in my life, I realized I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I don't even know what the preacher preached about or whatever or or what, but I do know this. I saw myself a sinner. I saw myself the only one that could save me was Jesus Christ, Amen. and I believed on him, and he saved me by his marvelous grace. Amen. I have been saved ever since. So the word of God. See, Peter said this, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible Amen. by the word of God, which liveth and, and uh, abideth forever. And so the Word of God has a part in your salvation, has a great part in your consecration as well. So it, and also here, uh, the law, uh, it, uh, the, it converts the soul. The law of, earth of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And then it cleanses the believer. If you remember in Psalm 119 and verse 9, wherewithal? Shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Remember what Jesus said to those disciples in the upper room that night? Now tomorrow, if we went back to that scene tomorrow, he's going to die on Calvary. But that night he said this unto the disciples, Now are you clean through the word which I have spoken unto you? Uh, my wife and I had come up uh, one year. We never did come up around Christmas time because we lived in Florida, and uh, I passed her down there, and it was it was uh, so hot, and up here it was so cold, and so we never did come in the winter, and so we we would come in the spring or the summer, and so I came. We came one spring, and I I said to my wife, I said, honey, I said. Um, I, I'm uh, I'm going over and see my cousin, my first cousin, Joe. And I said, I, I, I don't know if Joe's saved or not, and I'm going to go talk to him. So I got to, I found out where he lived, went to his house. He lived in a, in a, uh, in a single wide uh, mobile home. And so I went in to talk to him. And I said, and we talked a while. And, and I said, Joe, are you saved? He said, no, said I, I'm not saved. 
And I said, Joe, I said, I said, you need to be saved. He said, I know I do, James. I, I, I know I do. And I said, well, would you want to be saved? He said, well, sure, I want to be saved. So I, I took the Bible and I talked to him and showed him how to be saved. And Joe just fell down in the, in the floor of his home and began to ask the Lord to save him. And so after a while, he stood up and I said, now, Joe, I said, I said, did you get saved? He said, I said, did you ask the Lord to save you? He said, yes, sir. I said, do you believe the Lord saved you? He said, yes, I sure do. So you're saved? He said, yes. And so I, I don't do this now, but I was young. In the faith, I didn't know any better. And I said, how do you feel? And yeah. I think feeling's all right, amen, but yeah. we're not saved by feelings, amen, because of the feeling, a lot of times it comes your way but when you get saved, doesn't stay with you. <laughs> you have some difficulties along the way. And so I said, Joe, but I never will forget his answer. I said, Joe, how do you feel? He said, I'll tell you how I feel, James. He said, I feel like a little boy that his mother said, don't you go out in that yard. It's dirty out there. And so I didn't mind, Mama. I went out in the yard, and I got all filthy and dirty, and I came in, and Mama took me and gave me a bath. She said, that's the way I feel. So I, that's, I thought, that's amazing. That illustrates exactly what the Word of God does. It, it cleans us up. And so we, we need to hear it. Mercy. Boy, time flies when I'm up here. Goodness. Do you know I've been up here 45 minutes already? And nobody's asleep. That really gets me. <laughs> I guess you heard that one about the preacher. He said, hey there. I said, wake that fella up. He said, you wake him up. You put him to sleep. So I don't, I don't know. Let, let me get through here. I'm talking about the word of God and its work in my and your consecration. It does consecrate the whole being. Jesus said this in his high priestly prayer. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. Amen. And we can, ladies and gentlemen, we can live pleasingly in the sight of the Lord. Colossians 1, walking into all pleasing unto the Lord. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10. And then the word of God constitutes the facts. Doctrine. The word of God is... Uh, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Remember that? Amen. And so it constitutes, and, and the doctrine that this church is founded upon came right out of this book. No doubt in my mind, it came right out of here. And so anything that's established on the Word of God is going to last. It's going to endure and so then it, it not only constitutes the facts, but it corrects the wrong. And what's it given for? For doctrine, for reproof, remember that, for correction. And so that has to do with correcting the wrong. But then it confirms that which is right. Instruction in righteousness, then are ye my disciples indeed. Jesus said, under those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Not set you free, but make you free. It's the truth that sets men free. Okay? And then it consoles the Christian. Nothing. You know, many times you've went in... I'm sure in your heart heavy or maybe troubled about something that you cannot change and you cannot fix it at all. But getting reading in this book gives you assurance to know that God is with you, that he's going to help you. And just because that uh, the answer has not come now and the pastor brought it out in his Sunday school lesson this morning, son, always God does not say yes Sometimes he says no. But if he says no, he has a greater thing 
and a greater blessing in store for you than had he given you what you want. Let me illustrate with this, and I've got to quit. You remember the demoniac whom the Lord Jesus cast the devils out of? And after he had done that, all the town, of course, the news had scattered abroad, and they came out to see all that had happened. And here sat this demoniac, who earlier, as Luke said, he wore no clothes. And then the gospel writers also tell us that he cut himself with stones. He was bound by the devil. And the Lord cast those devils out of him. And then Mark tells us he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. You know what? He asked Jesus, he said, I want to go with you. Let me go with you. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to go with Jesus so he could tell everybody that Jesus saw, look what the Lord has done for me. But you know what Jesus said? No, I don't want you to go with me. I want you to go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord hath done for you. Amen. And you know what? He answered that man's prayer. That man wanted to glorify Christ for all that he had done for him. And so he thought if he did went with Jesus, that would be the way to do it. But Jesus said, no, I understand what you want, but I'm going to ask you to do it differently. And he did. And I don't know what all resulted out of that, but I'm confident that he won more people to Christ by doing that than he would have if he went along with the Lord Jesus. So, Oh, goodness, excuse me. Let's stand together. And uh, so thank you so much for your attention this evening. I praise the Lord for his goodness and for his grace that he has given unto us, allowing us to be here with you, dear people, this morning and tonight. Do you have a need, some need in your life, and you want to come and talk to the good Lord about it? And I don't know, there might be someone here who's never been saved. Let me encourage you, dear friend. Give your heart to Christ. Don't, uh, don't, don't live your life in such a way as you want to live it. Come, ask God to help you. Maybe you've got a problem you cannot solve. God can help you with it. You're carrying a burden that you feel is so heavy. God can help you. His shoulders are strong enough to carry all of our burdens, and he's willing to do that if we'll yield our heart to him. And I don't know, it could be some other need that I've not mentioned at all in both messages this day. Maybe your pastor mentioned it some time ago. Maybe you've been thinking about it and praying about it. You want the Lord to help you. He'll help you. You're important. The ladies sing a song tonight about it matters to the master. And you're important to him. He loves you. He doesn't have any big eyes and little U's in his family. He loves all of us the same. And whatever your situation is, God can help you with it if you'll trust him with it but that you must do. And I don't know, I encourage you to come. Our dear lady is playing on the piano, and as she does, if you have a need, you come on, talk to the good Lord about it. He'll help you. I assure you, he will help you. Strength for the journey. Remember when Elijah lay down on the juniper tree and wished to die and, went, and the angel came he had gone to sleep the angel awakened him and made a fire and built him a cake of bread he said arise Elijah and eat so he did lay back down went to sleep the angel wakened him again, made him another cake, said, eat this. The journey is too great for thee. So he went in the strength of that meat or those breads 40 days 
because the angel knew what would happen, what he was to do for God. I don't know, and you may not know, but the Lord does, and he has all that you're going to need to make the journey. Trust him for it. He's never failed yet, and he will not fail. for singing tonight. Thank you folks for coming. And I know you got a blessing. God's a helping us and I'm thankful for that. Thankful for God's mercy and God's grace. When we get over on the other side and get a good eyeball of this thing, we're going to be, we're going to tear the house down, so to speak, when we realize how real good God's been to us. We're getting a little bit of it now, but when we get over there, we're going to see it in fullness. And uh, I just pray the Lord will Help us to appreciate all that we can now, that God will do a work in us now. Amen? Try to invite someone to be with us tomorrow night, and uh, they need to hear, they need to hear, to reassure them if they already believe it, but to reassure them that the King James Bible is God's word for our day. God's preserved it. God's empowered it, and it'll help, and it'll bless and uh, folks need to know that. Many folks around the community that don't know that, they think just pick up any old Bible is okay. And uh, that's the purpose behind the meeting. We want the Word of God to be shown, and, and Brother Jones is going to prove that, show that, help us with that as we go through this study these few days. So you pray for him and pray that God would help him. I know how the devil fights our meetings, how he fights anything that's going forward for God. So you pray extra special prayer for Brother uh, Jones and, and dear Miss Sandra, that God would give them peace and rest and help them uh, in their time here with us and reward them greatly for being willing to come and be with us and preach to our folks. Uh, not a large crowd here, but you're going out all over the world. Philippines is listening. Japan's are listening. Uh, it's going out all over the world, all over the country. Folks are, are listening. Your youngin even knows you own. So, uh, Maybe, maybe he'll get some good preaching. Amen. <laughs> no, he, Brother Ward's a blessing down there, so we thank the Lord for them. They're good folks. I wish they wasn't so far away. I'd go visit with them more. Amen. Uh, but we thank the Lord for what he's done. Amen. All hearts clear tonight. You minded the Lord today. Obeyed God. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the good folks that's here tonight. Thank you for those that's tuned in with us. I pray that, God, you'll help the Word of God to find that lodging place in our heart. Help us to retain it in our thoughts. And may you use thy Word to strengthen us, encourage us, help us to be better Christians. May you get all the glory. May you get all the praise. I pray tonight that, Lord, you'd give Brother Jones and his dear wife a precious night of rest and, and refresh them. And help him, Lord, as he prepares for the service tomorrow night. Uh, make it easy for him as he delivers thy Word. And, uh, Lord, bring the folks out. I pray that you'd help our community to respond and come and get the, the, the truth of God's Word and uh, encourage folks and help folks. And, Lord, we'll sure thank you for all you do. Now, go with us tonight. Save the lost, please. Strengthen those that are going through sicknesses and sufferings. And, uh, Lord, for the Christian servant, I pray that you give them that strength they need. Bless and help them. We ask it all tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow night.